Hello, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, and I talk about its lore and its mythology, and what it's like to fight in-game as well. When I make these videos, I like to use your suggestions for monsters that you would like to see, because there's way too many for me to pick from. And then my patrons over on Patreon get to vote on which ones of those they like the best. And this week, they have voted on a suggestion that was made way back on my Bullywug video, a few years ago now, I reckon, that was first made by Lucas Lapidus, or Lapidus, who wanted to see chimeras, which have to be one of my all-time favourite types of creatures, for reasons that I'm sure I will gush about during the video. Anyway, thank you so much for your suggestion, Lucas. Thank you to my patrons for your support, and thank you for watching. So let's get started with today's video. Typically in D&D, chimeras are large, evil-aligned monsters, who are a fusion of several utterly unrelated creatures, and have, since their debut appearance in the game through the Monster Manual No. 1 for first edition, released in December 1977, been depicted as winged lions with two additional necks sporting heads of a goat and a dragon on the top. In the 5th edition Monster Manual, we're told that these volatile, cursed and fused monstrosities arose when Demogorgon, demon prince of madness and chaos, was first summoned to the material plane and found the creatures of our world altogether too mundane for his liking, and so meshed several beasts together and gifted them with demonic cruelty. In earlier editions of D&D, the Chimera was a creature of some intelligence, capable of speaking to a degree, and using its cunning to hunt its victims, which nine times out of ten were adventurers looking for glory. But since then, perhaps to distinguish it more from the Manticore, which has a roughly comparable silhouette, aside from only having one head, the Chimera has had more value placed on its destructive power and less on its mind. In 5th edition, these creatures have three intelligence, making them more in line with a dog or other semi-intelligent beasts, and while it can understand draconic, it cannot speak. We're told that some semblance of its hybridized minds do cause it to form habits associated with the creatures that make it up, however, even though its alignment is said to be chaotic, but that could be more of a reference to its demonic influences that surround its creation more than its mental state. Its draconic head drives this creature to hoard treasure and wealth, which generally causes a ready supply of food to actively seek it out in the form of greedy adventuring parties, hoping to lay claim to its gold-encrusted nest. Its goat head causes the Chimera to act very stubbornly, apparently, and never back down from a challenge, and its leonine head makes it fiercely territorial. The suffix AE is interchangeable with the suffix S to pluralize chimeras or chimerae. They're both utterly interchangeable and both correct. And with that suffix comes the assumption that this creature is based in Greek origins, which is absolutely correct. Legends of chimerae originate from ancient Greek legends, stemming from the ancient Greek word chimera, meaning she-goat. This chimera was a monstrous beast which pretty closely resembled the D&D interpretation, funnily enough. They were goat-lion hybrids with the head of a serpent for its tail and who could breathe fire, although despite this they had no wings or what we would now call a dragon head, the kind that we see in modern fantasy media. In ancient Greek myth, this creature was spawned as one of the offspring of Typhon and Echidna, two godlike, very difficult to describe, but monstrous demigod-like creatures which importantly made this creature a sibling of Cerberus and the Linnaean Hydra, two perhaps more popular myths. As with all mythical monsters, there's usually an equally benevolent hero who is sent to slay these creatures, and in the Chimera's case, their bane was a character known as Bellerophon, who fought this beast while riding on the back of the Pegasus, the winged horse. Usually hybridized creatures in our real world, and the offspring of mortals and dragons in D&D, referred to as half-dragons, are incapable of siring further offspring, as their genetics, or in D&D's case, perhaps magical blood, makes them effectively sterile, but for chimeras, this is not the case. Since these first creatures merged by Demogorgon were set loose into the world, or this horrid creature's own amusement, a whole species of chimeras have emerged. But producing offspring is not easy for the Chimerae. They have so many conflicting minds, even within one single body, that they tend not to live in mating pairs, and often can't stand to be around each other for long enough to raise their young, but they do have the biological urge to procreate. I couldn't find any precise 
documentation in D&D or in original Greek myths that indicate whether or not this creature has live offspring, like a mammal might, or if they produce eggs, as perhaps a dragon might, maybe something in between. But when they do have cubs, lambs, or hatchlings, they tend to give birth to exactly six, which I thought might be a reference to the number of the Demogorgon, some symbol or other, maybe an icon, of the Prince of Demons, but apparently also not. If you happen to know why exactly six are born each time, then please let me know down in the comments because it seems like a weirdly specific detail to just leave in without any notable reason. Anyway, chimeras have no actual drive to raise their young, and as a result will abandon them as soon as the female's year-long pregnancy concludes, nursing them with a porridgey or tar-like obsidian milk. Female chimeras will often abandon their young long before they reach maturity, however, and the excess black milk that they produce is often sought out by orcs, apparently, to whom this hideous nip syrup is an incredibly strong intoxicant. So be careful if you harvest this milk to sell as a drug back in your home city, because chimera milkshake will apparently, or at least almost certainly, bring a bunch of orcs to your yard. According to an article called The Ecology of the Chimera, written by Ed Greenwood for Dragon Magazine number 94 in 1985, this black milk is not the only reason that an adventurer might hope to harvest the body fluids of these creatures, which is one hell of a statement. In this article, we're told that chimerae are able to regenerate incredibly quickly, even regrowing heads in a matter of days after one is removed, making their blood highly prized by those hoping to make potions of regeneration and limb regrowth. But we're also told that this is incredibly hard to come by, as a chimera cannot easily be surprised. The article describes how only two of a chimera's three heads ever sleep at a time, leaving one constantly awake to keep an eye out for intruders who may pose a threat to them or their mighty treasure hordes. Hello there, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of my patrons over on Patreon for their support, but in particular, I wanted to give a shout out to all of the wonderful patrons who are backing me at the Silver Archfey level. This month you are Nicholas G. Silver, Raptor Dio, Jelly Pig, Duck Quack, Nap in Camo, Jonathan Foster, Benjamin Colburn, Yorick Beast, Ethan Dibby, Skyrush Soul, Nathan Stratton, Amanda and Jake Westfall, Ken Doman, Peter Balf, Max Schluter, Ryan H., Tim Klemer, Steve Harrison, Dan Waterman, Styrax, Colby Monroe, It's Just Avi, Sam Hickson, Brandon Kerr, Bork Boulderbender, Darth Katana, Trevor Traub, Max Copeland, Oliver Thorvald Mellock, Dominique Jolly, AJ, Tamling, Aldrin, Christian Palmer Smith, and Brandon Wilkinson. If you're interested in joining the little community that we have over on Patreon, I'll make sure to leave a link to that down below in my description box. Patrons get access to loads and loads of rewards, like this shout out, but there are also shout outs for every single patron on my monthly live stream. Every patron is entered into a raffle at the beginning of each month, where one person is randomly selected for a character illustration that might get made into a commission corner video, if you're interested in getting a commission. They get copies of all of the artwork that I do each month, which includes the video that you're watching right now. They get Patreon exclusive videos that are about my lore, my homebrew world, and my adventures in D&D. And some of us get to have one-on-one -on -one chats every month where we get to talk and I can do some drawing for you, including things like drawing a commission while we chat. But anyway, I've taken up far too much of your time, but thank you so much for helping me to thank these guys, and I'll let you get back to your video. Cheers! Now, the mythological chimera is not the only kind that we encounter. Biological chimeras exist in our real world. While they may not be as immediately as exciting as the fire-breathing goat lions of D&D, they are officially recognised, and you may even be one. A biological chimera is any creature composed of cells with more than one distinct genotype. A very common example can be seen in calico or tortoise shell cats, which are often chimeras. Their warped and twisting patterned fur is actually as a result of them being a hybrid of two different types of cat. And if a tissue sample were taken from a skin patch which produces ginger fur, and a similar sample taken from the areas which produce the black fur, the DNA would show that these are actually two different unrelated cats in the same body. Similarly, some humans also exhibit this trait. For a time, any person who undergoes a bone marrow transplant will produce blood cells with both the donor and the original DNA, making them a chimera. But some people are even born this way. 
In 2015, a study showed that most women who give birth temporarily grow tissue which is identical to their children, making them chimeras of their own offspring for a time even after they've given birth. And this has actually been seen even in children long after birth as well, if the mother was born with what is known as undetectable microchimerism, where certain areas of the body may permanently produce DNA that the rest of the body does not exhibit, which is often caused by someone absorbing an unknown twin in the womb. In certain rare cases, children born of people who are microchimeras may be partially coded by one or another kind of DNA that the mother produces, making it seem as though the mother may not actually genetically be related to their own child if a blood test was taken later in life, much to the confusion of the person who actually carried and gave birth to this child. The thing with human chimeras is that it usually exhibits no particularly exciting or noticeable traits aside from massively confusing DNA tests. So there's almost no way to know if you're a chimera or not, but there's always that chance. Human chimeras who come about not through organ donation or bone marrow transplant are born when multiple fertilized cells fuse together during pregnancy, making you technically two people in one. And so the chimera, stemming from this original myth of a specific lion-like serpenty goat beast slain by Bellerophon, has come to mean a collection of fused creatures, and is even used in the modern scientific world. Personally, in my D&D campaigns, I very much plan to adopt the concept that all fused creatures are known as chimeras in some capacity. So as whereas the phrase monstrosity might be a broad overarching term for a lot of these creatures, things like pegasi, griffins, hippogriffs, and other creatures that very clearly have various parts from specific monsters might be known as chimeras of a type with a classic or perhaps greater chimera being the kind that we see in the monster manual. To assist in this distinction, or perhaps lack thereof, one of my favourite D&D books of all time, The Mythic Odysseys of Theros, inspired by Greek legends and Magic the Gathering, offers us a new way to flavour chimeras, which I thoroughly enjoy and I hope you will too. We're given a stat block for chimeras that are slightly stronger than those in the monster manual, allowing us to make beasts that are fused from multiple different forms. These Theron Chimeras give you a body composition, head attacks, breath weapons, and tail attacks, which you can roll randomly or pick to make your own perfect monstrosity. You get options like making your creature have the body of a plains creature like a bull or a bear, which would make this creature lose its flying speed, but increasing its resilience, granting it resistance to cold and fire damage. A coastal creature, such as a heron or a shark, gains a swimming speed equal to its walking speed and can breathe air and water. A mountain creature's body, such as that of a ram or a dragon, means that the chimera doesn't provoke opportunity attacks when it flies in to swoop down at an enemy. Swamp-bodied chimeras, whose torsos resemble a lizard or a spider, gain a climbing speed. You can climb up difficult surfaces as if having the spider climb ability. Their head attacks could be a set of bull horns, a shark's bite, a unicorn horn, which deals radiant damage on top of its normal stabbing damage, or a cockatrice beak, which has the chance to turn people to stone. We're given a cluster of breath weapon attacks, including a lightning breath attack, a tidal wave breath, a venom spray or a necrotic breath attack, in exchange for the traditional fire damage that a chimera tends to perform. And to make it more in line with Greek legends, we get a various set of tail attacks, which include a venomous tail, allowing it to have this serpentine head on its butt, which can poison people, a perplexing tail, which give this creature a random additional head where its tail should be, rolling randomly on the head attack's ability, so you might get hit by some bull horns that come out of this creature's butt apparently, a shark tail with a large fin that can knock people away, or a constricting tail which can grapple people, perhaps again going down the serpentine route, or perhaps even something like octopus tentacles if you wanted to make a purely aquatic creature. In the mythic Odysseys of Theros, rather than a demonic influence causing these creatures, deities and magicians are responsible for hybridizing these monsters, and this causes their blood to be immensely chaotically magical, and grants them an ability called spell turning, which no doubt contributes to their increased challenge rating from a challenge rating 6 monster in the monster manual to a challenge rating 7 in Theros. With this feature, whenever a spell is cast at a chimera, not area of effect spells, but specifically something that targets that creature, the chimera gets to 
make a saving throw against that spell, and if it's successful, the spell doesn't affect it, but instead rebounds back onto the caster, which makes this beast incredibly, incredibly deadly to fight, and I'd be convinced to maybe put it beyond a challenge rating 7, but I really want to use these creatures, so maybe not. They seem like a fun toy box. But with the increased difficulty of these creatures, how can we actually fight them in combat? What can we do to deal with a Chimera if we feel overwhelmed by its obvious power? Well, we're actually told that the Draconic Head makes them incredibly vulnerable to flattery and gifts of treasure and admiration, and as a result, anyone who can speak Draconic, or who can perform a satisfactory animal handling check in the eyes of the Dungeon Master, while offering something of value to this Chimera, may be able to circumvent combat with one altogether, or at least distract it for long enough for their allies to make a more advantageous attack. Some DMs like to use the various body parts of this creature to embody its different abilities. Personally, I like the idea of all of these creatures being able to breathe fire, for example, but one technique that comes to mind may be to make this creature have a larger health pool in general, but allow characters to target its various heads or limbs to render various different abilities inert, like cutting off the dragon head, famously, may prevent it from breathing fire. Cutting off the goat head may, well, obviously stop you from getting rammed by a giant goat head, but additionally, without the stubborn goat brain in there helping to drive this creature's decision making, its confidence may be knocked, and it may start to become vulnerable to driving it away with fear-based attacks and so on. Now, in terms of my artistic rendition here, it's pretty clear that I've gone wild with the Theros customization chart to let me have a little bit of hammerhead shark in here, a wolf head, and lots of draconic parts as well. The overall colour palette ended up shifting to a kind of blue colour, and I like the idea of giving this creature a blue dragon's lightning breath and lightning associate abilities, just to make it a little bit different from the traditional fire-breathing chimera that we see in the monster manual. I think I've mentioned before that I'm really not a fan of the various bits of animals glued together aesthetic, even though I love a lot of the creatures that come out of it as a result. I don't really like the lack of cohesiveness that you see with something that has perhaps like green reptilian legs, bright yellow sort of chicken arms, perhaps brown fur, and a red dragon head somewhere meshed into the middle of it. I like my colour palettes to be enmeshed across the entire body of my creatures to make everything sort of fit together a little bit more easily. And additionally, I've chosen to add various demonic and draconic parts to each of the heads so that all of these body parts kind of fuse together a little bit more. There's lupine-like fur all over this creature, even on its sort of fishy, sharky tail. And to me, that meshes it together quite well. But then again, it's a chimera, and perhaps that's the point, that they're not supposed to mesh together particularly well. If I was making a kind of flesh golem-esque inspired chimera, where someone has literally stitched together parts of a creature that they have fused, that's probably the way that I would go about it, making them looking like separate things. But seeing as this is a creature that's supposedly born with all of these parts intact, I wanted to infuse all of these colours together and all of these different textures and elements. But anyway, I really enjoyed drawing this, I enjoyed what I came up with, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did too, please make sure to leave a little like, a little thumbs up down below, perhaps favourite this video and share it with the rest of your D&D party. And if you're a DM, make sure to add this to your favourite so you can come back to it later, the next time you're using a Chimera in your campaign. Remember, if you'd love a copy of this image, I'll leave a link to my Patreon down below in the description box, because my patrons get copies of all of my illustrations, among other rewards. And make sure to comment with a monster that you'd like to see me draw, because my to-draw list is ever-expanding, and i just like to hear from you guys. But anyway, until next time, happy monster hunting, and good luck in your adventures. Bye!